Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 398th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. Do you want to save money at the grocery store, eat more organic, whole foods, cultivate food security, and feel more connected to the earth? If so, then growing your own food is a no-brainer. You wouldn't believe how many people come to me claiming that they can't grow their own food. They think they don't have enough space, that they're too busy, or that they simply don't have what it takes. Perhaps you've fallen for one of these gardening myths. If you think you can't grow food, or if you think the only food that you have access to is what you buy in the grocery store, I have a life-changing webinar that you need to see. It's free and will help you unearth your inner gardener. I've helped thousands of people just like you learn to grow their own food, and I'm speaking from my own experience when I say that with the right knowledge in place, there is no such thing as a black thumb. With this webinar, you can begin making your garden dreams come true and start growing delicious, nutritious food for your family. Just text GARDEN to 44222 or go to IWANTTOGARDEN.COM and you will receive our free webinar about the seven key factors you need to know to grow your own food. Remember, that's GARDEN to 44222 or IWANTTOGARDEN.COM. Today on our podcast, we have someone who cooks with eight ingredients or less. We're talking with Brandy Doming about delicious vegan meals. Brandy is the creator of the popular blog, The Vegan Eight. She is also a mom, wife, and designer. Her blog was voted a top 21 vegan blog of 2016 by the hugely popular vegan magazine, Veg News. She's appeared regularly in Forks Over Knives magazine and was featured in the documentary Eating You Alive. She lives with her husband and daughter in Houston, Texas. Her new cookbook is The Vegan Eight, 100 Simple delicious recipes made with eight ingredients or less. Welcome to the show today. Brandy, are you ready to rock? I sure am. Thank you so much for having me. Excellent. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at today? Absolutely. My story is basically how we came to heal my husband's gout through a plant-based vegan diet. He started getting gout in 2005. That's when he had his first flare-up. And for those that are not familiar with gout, it's basically the buildup of uric acid in the body. And when there's too much uric acid, it migrates to the joints, mainly the feet, knees, and sometimes the elbows. And it causes very excruciating pain, Mm -hmm. swelling, and redness. And it's very debilitating. My husband would be on crutches a lot. And we started going to doctors and finally got that diagnosis that it was gout because the first time he had it, we did not know what it was. We thought maybe he just stumped his foot on something. Mm -hmm. But after it started happening often and more frequently, that's when we started going to several different doctors. And basically, they would just put on a lot of medications. They never really gave diet advice. They would just say, you know, avoid red meat and avoid alcohol. Isn't that a funny thing? That's just strange to me. Yeah, definitely. He didn't drink anyway, so that was already something that we knew was not the cause. We didn't eat much red meat, but we ate a lot of chicken, we ate a lot of seafood, and of course a lot of dairy. And they never once said that those could be the cause. In fact, we were often encouraged by multiple doctors to eat chicken and eat more dairy. They would actually say that dairy would help heal the gout. So this went on for years. I mean, 2005 to 2012. Wow. It literally became a very difficult way of life because I became fearful to cook because I was always worried if what I was going to cook was either going to hurt him or help him. It was a very hard way to live. It affected our travels. It affected our plans. And he would be on crutches sometimes for two to three weeks. Wow. Yeah. As soon as one foot would heal, then the other foot would flare up. It went on like that forever. So after my daughter was born in 2011, becoming a new mom, I was dealing with postpartum depression and trying to take care of a new baby and my new identity as a mother. And he had gout almost the entire first year after her birth. Mm -hmm. And so I was taking care of her and him. And I reached a point where I just couldn't do it anymore. It became too difficult. And that's when I started researching plant-based and vegan. I don't know how I came across it, but I'd already tried everything else. I'd already tried removing every other type of food and adding foods and getting all this contradicting advice, that that's when I thought, well, hey, can't hurt to try this. Once we finally adopted a whole foods, plant
plant-based diet and I started making everything homemade, within, I say, about two to three weeks, his gout started to go away. Seriously? Absolutely. That fast? Yes, it was that fast. And it stayed away. That was the key. I thought, oh my gosh, okay, he has no gout. It's been a few weeks. Let's keep this going. (laughs) Right. And here we are six years later. It was the healing solution. It was the miracle. I didn't think it was possible. And he had been on so many different medications. The medications would have side effects and they would make him vomit and they would make him dizzy. And he missed work a lot because of the gout. And to have it just all be the answer down to food is amazing. So as long as we don't eat those things, then he's fine. Mm -hmm. There's still certain plant foods that are high purine foods that cause uric acid buildup. And those are like cauliflower, mushrooms. He can't eat lentils or too many beans. But for the most part, you know, we eat a lot of potatoes and rice and soups and stews and he loves fruit. So all those things are actually very healing to his body. So that's what I focus on cooking for him. Right. Wow. This has been an extraordinary journey for you. Yes, definitely. And now, of course, my daughter has been raised vegan. So it just totally changed the whole direction of our life. Food, just food. Right. (laughs) It's amazing. I often say that there are three things in our culture that cause 100% of the disease. And we have control of all three of them if you were out in the garden. And that's lack of nutrition in our food, environmental toxins, and stress. Absolutely. What you're talking about here is, you know, food as an environmental toxin. Definitely. It didn't just affect him, it affected me too. Of course. You know, we traveled to Europe in 2008 and half the trip was him limping and being in pain. And Mm -hmm. so my memories of Paris and Ireland were not good. (laughs) Right. I'm just glad that we don't have to live that life anymore. Right. It seems to me that the foods that you gave up probably cause inflammation. Is there some truth to that? Yes, definitely. When the doctors would tell us to eat more chicken and eat more dairy, I would literally cook chicken and give him yogurt and things like that in the middle of a gout flare-up, thinking that it's going to help him. Mm -hmm. It just made things worse. I followed their advice. But then that's when I realized after doing this for so many years, okay, their advice is not working. Right. Every article I would find online, I mean, I would stay up till two or three in the morning so many nights trying to find anything online. And one place would tell us, eat this. Another place would say, don't eat that. So everything was (laughs) conflicting. And that's what was so frustrating for me because I was trying so hard to heal him naturally. I didn't want him being dependent on these medications his whole life. Yeah. So I had to find the answer myself. And thank God it was the right answer. Right. Well, and it sounds to me like you would have kept going until you found the right answer. Yes, I'm a very determined individual. (laughs) Nice. And that's what started the vegan blog, too. When I started cooking vegan, then I got this newfound passion to share with others. And that's what started the blog. And, you know, here we are. (laughs) So when was that? I started my blog in 2012, and I had a different blog before The Vegan Ate, and I had it for about a year. It was vegetarian at the time and then shortly became vegan. But I started The Vegan Ate in 2013, and that's when I wanted to dedicate simplicity, but still comfort food, still delicious, and everything being eight ingredients or less, because I'd realized that the recipes that were most popular from my previous blog Mm -hmm. were all eight ingredients or less. And those were the ones that all the readers would keep making. And so that's what started the concept for my new blog and then the book and everything. Well, that's got to make it super simple to cook. Absolutely. Very simple, very easy, not intimidating. And I focus on using ingredients that everybody knows. Mm -hmm. I don't use, you know, superfoods or weird powders. I don't focus on ingredients that people have not heard of. Right. Just everyday foods, potatoes and rice and Mm -hmm. beans and vegetables and things like that. And that way it's appealing to anybody. Right. So I just jumped on your website and one of the things I'm seeing is 12 oil-free vegan granola recipes. Tell me about that. Yes. I also do oil-free. I found that oil is inflammatory. Mm -hmm. And so that was another thing I removed out of our diet for him many years ago. And, you know, we're not perfect eaters. If we do go out to eat, we don't do it very often. But if we do, you know, it's almost impossible to get things oil-free if you go out to eat. But at home, I do not cook with any oil. And I prefer to focus my fats on whole foods like nuts and seeds and avocados. That way you're getting the full nutritional profile of the food. Right. And in, you know, using almond butter instead of oil or cashew butter or things like that, it gives an actual deeper flavor. That's what I like to use in my granola recipes instead of oil or butter that, you know, is traditionally used. Right. So how did this book come to be? Well, I been doing the blog since 2013. And I started getting some people interested in coming to me to write a book. And that's how I met with my current publisher. And they absolutely loved the concept of an eight ingredient vegan book because there's not really 
one out there like that. Mm -hmm. There are some, you know, few number concept books that have come out before, but nothing specifically all vegan and pretty much everything's gluten-free except for like a couple of recipes. And also oil-free is the thing too, that makes it a little bit different. And my focus also too, with the recipes is even though they're few ingredients, you would think that they would rely on a bunch of processed things to keep that ingredient list down. I actually don't. I use whole foods for salsa. If I call for salsa in a recipe, I do offer a homemade salsa recipe in the book. That way, if somebody wants to make the homemade version, they can, or if they want for convenience, they could buy Mm store-bought. I just try to make it an option for everybody. That way it's simple. I try to make everything whole food based as healthy as possible. It doesn't taste that way. It's comfort. It's wholesome and filling. I don't like salads and small portions. I like big portions and things that are really going to make me feel satisfied. Yeah. So you've been interacting with people on your blog since 2012. So that's like six years. Right. What kind of an impact have you been seeing in people's lives out there? It's been amazing. I never anticipated that my blog would help so many people. Mm -hmm. Over the years, I've heard from a lot of mothers. I'm a big baker and I focus on a bunch of gluten-free recipes. I'll get emails all the time from mothers thanking me that because of your cake recipe, I was able to throw a birthday party for my son or my daughter and the smile on their face because I was able to find a recipe that met all their allergies. And I'll get a lot of recipe requests from readers and I will specifically create something just for them because my focus is to help as many people out there as possible. Right. It's very, very important to me. That is the whole reason I started it. And then I've also heard from many readers that have lost 50 to 80 pounds just by following my recipes. Mm Mm-hmm. Because they're comforting and they're satiating, but they're healthy too. Right. With the exception of maybe like some of the desserts are, (laughs) my desserts are indulgent. So you don't want to eat those every single day of your life. But you know, the savory recipes are good for you. That's where I'm going now is the dessert section of your book, Showstopper Chocolate Cake. Oh, yes. Get this, prep time, 20 minutes, bake time, 30 minutes, you chill it for 30 minutes, and it's 16 servings. Yes, that cake is fabulous. <laughs> that is my favorite chocolate cake I've ever created or eaten. And my mother said the same thing. My mother is not vegan, and ever since I created that recipe many months ago, she's made it every single month since then. She loves it that much. Wow. It tastes just like a traditional chocolate cake, you know, with oil and eggs and butter and all that, and it really, truly does. You cannot tell a difference. Nice. It's not fat-free. It's just made differently. Right. It'll still put on the pounds if you eat all 16 servings. Oh, definitely. (laughs) It's not a diet cake, that's for sure. It's an indulgent one. This also has wheat in it. You had mentioned gluten-free, but there is wheat in this one. Yes, but I do offer a gluten-free version under the notes for people that do avoid gluten. I tried to make the book available to people who are gluten-free or not. You know what I mean? Like some people don't care about gluten. So I tried to offer two versions for everybody so it could be a fit for anybody. Yeah. It was a lot of testing, but worth it. Right. One of those things though out there that causes a lot of inflammation is wheat. Right. You know, so we have to be super conscious about that. And one of the challenges that we have with this is that diet plans or ways of eating aren't a one size fit all. So we have to actually go out there and discover what works for ourselves. Have you found that? I totally agree. Not everybody gets gout if they eat seafood. Right. But if you give one plate of shrimp to my husband, which he hasn't had that in years, but back then he'd be laid up on crutches for two weeks. Wow. Of course, I've never had a problem. I'm not prone to it. But some people, like you said, They just react differently to different foods. But I do believe that a plant-based diet is healthy for everybody. The more fruits and vegetables you can get in your diet is a benefit to anybody. So I'm not a vegan. I'm not a vegetarian. I'm mostly vegetarian. Uh And the impact that meat has on the planet as far as resources to make it happen is huge. So, you know, that's one of the big reasons, you know, I avoid meats for the most part is that you know, there's an environmental impact that goes along with them. Right. There's a lot of people who like to adapt like meatless Mondays or try to just eat less meat, even if they don't omit it completely. It's great, you know, to at least reduce it. Yeah, exactly. So Janice told me a quick story this morning. Janice is the podcast producer and manager of all things that we do here. She said that you giggled with her and said, you know, I don't really grow anything. I don't have a green thumb. Any kind of plant that I've ever bought, whether it's basil or, you know, rosemary, that none of them survived in my possession. I've been able to keep two little cactuses alive for like a year, but that's it. It's probably really hard to kill a cactus though, I'm guessing. So. <laughs> I would 
say that's probably the case. You know, that's okay because we need yous out in the world to help make awesome chocolate cake recipes for us. <laughs> yeah. And for those that are growing their own food, well, now you have some yummy recipes. Exactly. So there's a hundred recipes in this book. Do you have a favorite one? That's so hard to pick. On page 133, it says my favorite savory meatless bean balls. Yeah, that's probably my favorite meal type of food. I mean, it's not a dead ringer for meat, but I wasn't trying to make it taste exactly like meat, but you won't miss the meat. That's for sure. It's hearty and chewy and a thick texture. My brother is a big fitness person. He lifts weights and he is definitely a meat and potatoes kind of guy and he Uh absolutely loved them. There's a barbecue sub meatball sandwich on the next page. I think it's after that one. And he He like ate like three of them back to back and he loves meat, but I wanted it to appeal to anybody and and for the person not to care whether it's meat or not. It's just delicious. That's the thing. But yeah, that one. And then also I really like the cream cheese spinach artichoke dip in the book. uh That one's really, really good. It's very rich and decadent. And of course, the whole dessert chapter, I love chocolate. So (laughs) (laughs) who doesn't? I know, right? Well, one of the things I like about your book is on the top left of every one of the recipes, it says prep time, cook time, and how many servings. Yes. You know, for those of us that are crazy busy doing life, knowing, you know, a prep time on this, it might take 30 minutes the first time, but once you do it once or twice, 20 minutes to make Cuban black bean stuffed sweet potatoes. It's like, I want these. These sound incredible. I tried to make the majority of all the recipes be done within an hour. Mm Mm-hmm. And then there is a chapter called Time Crunch Lunches that everything is done within 30 minutes. Because, you know, some people want a very fast lunch, especially ones that have kids and they need something quick. And me, I am definitely am not a person that likes a recipe that takes too long. There's a time and a place for those, you know, holidays or guests coming over. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, the whole book, they're fairly quick and they're definitely easy and minimal ingredients. When you sit down and eat it, it doesn't feel like it's missing something, you know, that's packed full of flavor, especially the breakfast chapter. These breakfast recipes are not boring smoothies or a bowl of oatmeal. I mean, I tried to go all out with the breakfast chapter so they would be the type of breakfast that would impress guests. Things like bakery style blueberry muffins and pancakes and crepes and things like that. Nice. So I'm going to shift on you and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed how you overcame that failure, and what you learned from it. When I think of a failure, I can't really pinpoint an exact experience or event that I would call a failure specifically, just because everything that I've gone through in my life or even the mistakes that I've made, I wouldn't change it because it's been something that I've learned from or grown from. Mm -hmm. When I think of something that has been, I guess, a failure in a way of something that I've struggled with a lot, it's been self-doubt in myself or comparing myself to others. That's what I think of as my biggest struggle throughout my whole life. Mm -hmm. And it's been a process of trying to focus on myself and my own abilities and being confident in them and knowing that I don't need to compare myself to others. You know, we're all unique in our own passions and talents and whatever they are. And to be confident in that and to focus on believing in myself. And by doing that, I've been getting to a place where I'm proud of who I am and what I'm doing. And that's what helps me to overcome self-doubt. Yeah. Well, and that self-doubt, for me, it sounds like this voice that shows up in my head that says stuff like, and maybe it's not even hearing it say it, but it's just what comes up for me is like, who are you to think that you can do that? And that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. It's been a battle for me for my whole life, honestly. But I mean, it's blogging in a weird way has actually helped me because I've been able to connect with people all over the world and help them. And that has actually helped boost my confidence because all I've ever really truly wanted to do is whatever career path I went was ultimately to be that it was helping somebody else. But at the same time, it'd be something that I enjoy. Right. And I've finally reached that. I've gone through so many different career choices and none of them ever filled my heart the way this does. Sweet. The blogging has helped me to overcome that. Yeah. So for me in about 2004, I was able to distinguish that ego, the voice, the one that says, who are you to think? And I actually had a conversation with it and I told it to shut up. (laughs) I did. You know, I was looking straight ahead and all of a sudden I turned to the right and I looked up toward the ceiling as if I was talking to somebody up there that's, you know, more powerful than me. Right. Uh huh. I said, listen, what I'm up to in the world is much more important than whatever you have to say. So just shut up. But that's good. You got to. I mean, I do that to myself too. I self-talk myself. Now, when I start feeling like overwhelmed or struggling or nobody's going to like this or this is going to fail or whatever, those bad thoughts, Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm like, no, you are strong. You are confident. 
Yeah. You have abilities. You have something to offer people. You know, you're full of confidence. And, you know, that does help. I have to self-talk myself a lot, but mm-hmm. it works. Right. you got to stick with that mindset and those thoughts as opposed to the negative ones or they will take over. Right. But it's a process. <laughs> You know, there's this story, an elder was talking to a younger person in this organization, and I may not be getting it all right, but the younger person was saying, how do I control the voices in my head? And the elder said, which one are you feeding? Right. Exactly. You know, which voice are you feeding? Because that's the voice that gets louder the more you feed it. Absolutely. And I let too many years go where I would, you know, feed the negative voice. And you literally have to cover it with the positive. And that's why for me, I have to say it out loud. Mm -hmm. It, It does. It quiets the other one. You just keep doing it. Yeah. Well, when I had that conversation, when I looked up to the right, I verbalized it. I said it out loud. Right. I know for the past couple of minutes, we've been diving into this conversation. But for me, this is one of the most, I'm getting chills right now sharing about this. This is one of the most important turning points of my life is when I actually got to a place where I was able to distinguish that noise that was going on and do something about it. That's awesome. Sounds to me like you did the same. So, yes. you know, for those of you listening out there, start listening for what you're you're telling yourself and change that. Right. I used to say, oh, I can't do this. I mean, I literally would say out loud constantly, I can't do this. And my husband has always been the one to say, you can do this. I mean, he has been, he's helped me too, because he's always believed in me more than I believed in myself. So, you know, having people around you that are a support system too, that encourage you as opposed to just jump on the negative train, you know, that's important too. Big time. I have Heidi as my sweetheart and she's huge for that for me. Yeah, you need that. You got to have somebody who helps you. Yeah. So what do you consider your biggest success? Well, I would say two things. Becoming a mother, becoming the mother to my daughter, Olivia, is my greatest achievement. There's nothing that is more important to me than being a mom. But then as far as a specific success, I would say it would be finding the solution to heal my husband. Oh, huge. Because our lives completely changed. Everything changed. And if it weren't for me finally saying, okay, we're going vegan and him going, uh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) That was me. That was my decision. It was not his decision. But, you know, when you're in pain almost all the time, he was at the point where he was just ready to do whatever because we'd already tried everything else. Right. Doing that, that's definitely my biggest success. Well, and it was a win for everybody involved, it sounds like. You know, other people are in my life as well. I mean, I have so many people in my family now that eat vegan so much more and eat so many more vegetables. And it's awesome to see the trickle effect. (laughs) I love that, the trickle effect. Cool. So what drives you? What drives me is I would bring it back to my blog again, knowing that I'm helping people. I have days where I'm, you know, frustrated or maybe having a down day and I realize, wait a sec, I got to remember why I do this. I got to remember my focus. And it's knowing that I'm helping other people. I mean, I get so many wonderful messages from readers telling me that my recipes have changed their life. Getting those kind of messages, that drives me. It makes me remember that this isn't about me. That's not why I started it. It's never been about me. I mean, the whole reason why we went vegan was not for me. It was for my husband. I just did vegan with him to support him. Yeah. And of course, it ended up changing my own health. So that's what drives me knowing that I'm helping other people. For those of you out there listening that aren't vegan and you're, you know, devout meat eaters, which is fine. Right. There are so many recipes and so many ways to eat that I've discovered over the past couple, three years playing with this, that it's just extraordinary food. Yes. And there's so much variety. Yeah. I mean, there's so many different ways you can make different types of cuisines and recipes with the same, like chickpeas, for instance. Oh my gosh, you can make chickpeas in 10,000 different ways I've discovered. I eat so much more variety now than I ever did because Mm -hmm. I have so much fun with it. All these different flavor combos too, that I find to be so much more fun now. Because before we would eat the same things over and over and over. Right. So if you could recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be and why? It would be The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale. Imagine that after the conversation we just had, right? (laughs) (laughs) And that's one book that has helped me too, because his book specifically, I mean, he writes in a way that's not difficult to understand. You would think a book like that might be too I don't know, professor sounding like Mm -hmm. or something, but he's just very simple in his approach. He focuses on training you to rethink, which is kind of what we were just talking about. Right. Whenever those bad thoughts come, immediately turn it over to something positive. And obviously, you know, because he used to be a very negative thinker himself and he learned to change his life and his 
thought processes, and then he just lays it down in the book of how to do the same thing. And it all starts with believing in yourself. And it's not easy to do, but it's a process. And do it each day, and you get a little bit better. Yeah, well, you know, changing a habit, which is really what this is. This is a habit of thinking bad about yourself. Changing a habit starts with realizing there's a problem. Absolutely. And then noticing when it happens and then adjusting as you go. Right. I'd heard amazing things about that book, and that's why I got it, because I thought, okay, I want something to teach me how to do this, because I just couldn't figure out how to do it on my own enough. So (laughs) (laughs) the book's wonderful. That's why I asked this question, is because books are wonderful. Absolutely. So what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? I would say find what it is that when you think of what you're most passionate about or that you love doing, find out what that is, figure it out what that thing is and immerse yourself in it, be confident in it, go after it, trust in your abilities and pursue it. For me, it was finding a way to help people. And of course, that's through cooking. And I had no idea where my life would go, but I decided to start a blog and immerse myself fully in it, devote myself to it. And it's completely been amazing direction of my path. I never in a million years would have thought that I would be writing a book, uh, certainly not a cookbook. So just find that thing and, and be confident enough to go after it. Nice. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Brandy. Thank you so much for having me. It's been fun. Absolutely. And we have a special offer for our listeners today that you've offered and you're going to give away some books. Yay. Yeah. Some of your book, The Vegan Eight. So what we're going to do is email Janice And the email is podcast at urbanfarm.org and put in the subject line, I claim my book. For the first few people that reach to us, we'll send that out to you. Sounds great. So how can our listeners get a hold of you? They can reach me on my website at thevegan8.com. I have a contact page on there and they can reach me. I got an email address on there. They could reach me through there. And I always respond to all my messages. So just give me a couple of days. I will be there. Awesome. You can also find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash vegan8. We are your urban farming resource. You can find our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. Also visit urbanfarm.org to find articles, podcasts, webinars, courses, and and more. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Claiming your inner urban farmer is easy. Grow food, share it, and name your farm. Then let the world know you're an urban farmer while supporting our podcast. Pick up your urban farmer bling, hats, and t-shirts at imanurbanfarmer.com. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.